635. So we will get this show on the road. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank everyone for making it out tonight, the candidates um, and all of the viewers as well. Really, really appreciate that. I will just draw everyone's attention. Um, the debate night must be recorded. So uh, we are recording it right now. Um, so just as a heads up in case, you know, that impacts whether or not you turn on the video or, um, you know, anything like that. Um, the next thing I do want to do just before we get into it tonight um, is a quick land acknowledgement. Um, and so I would just like to quickly acknowledge that Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory, um, and that we're all grateful to live, learn, and play on these lands. And much like I do during a regular council meeting, I would encourage everyone to continue going out um, and educating yourself on all the Indigenous territory um, across Canada. Okay. With that being said, once again, welcome. It's great to see you all. Um, so tonight we have the VP Ops and VPSA debate night. Um, so welcome to our candidates, uh, Jane and Evan. And um, just some brief introductions. My name is Nick Neoklaus, and I am the Chief Electoral Officer and Speaker. I will be running this debate night, and I do have the Elections Committee here with me as well. Uh, Salvatore is our Deputy Returning Officer, the DRO. Andrew Anderson is the Chief Returning Officer, the CRO. Andrew De Silva is the Andrew De Silva is the Director of Governance, um, and finally, you have Kindness Edwards, uh, the Vice President of Student Affairs, current Vice President of Student Affairs. So. Just before she waved, there we go. Before we get into it, just for everyone watching and for the candidate's sake, I am just going to briefly kind of go over the debate night rules again. Um, so I will get into that now. First and foremost, um, because each of the candidates, it is just uh, them in their kind of respective writings. So tonight's going to be more of like a Q and A style thing, but that's totally all good. That just means I don't have to pull a name from a hat to see who goes first. Um, each candidate is going to be given a five minute opening. Um, and then once again, you'll have five minutes to close. In between that period, there will be again that Q&A session conducted by myself, the speaker. And right now, I currently do have a list of questions in front of me. So prior to this debate night, um, there was a form sent out to collect questions from, you know, the student demographic. And so that's what I have here right now in front of me. We kind of sifted through them and picked out some good ones. However, um, because again, it's sort of a Q&A session, there will be time for probably a few audience questions at the end. So uh, as we're going through the debate, just message those to me um, and we'll probably have time for a couple and I'll sort of screen them and give them to the candidates once we're done that uh, list of questions. On that topic, each candidate will have three minutes to answer each, each of the questions. I will have a timer here and um, I will do my best to, to be strict and keep us on kind of uh, on schedule and on track. However, for the candidate's sake, uh, when you hit about two minutes and 30 seconds in, uh, rather than saying anything, I'm going to do the little ta-da symbol and I'll like hold up my hands and wave at you. Uh, and then when there's five, I'll start counting down uh, like this. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, other than that, again, um, there, you have five minutes for a closing. Uh, the debate night is being recorded and will be uploaded to Facebook uh, and YouTube after this. And finally, in the event that the debate is online, all candidates must have a reliable internet connection and source a mic and camera. And I can see you both there. So it looks like we've already got that rule uh, set up. So that's very, very good. Okay, awesome. With all of that out of the way, um, let's get started. And so we will be starting tonight with the VP Ops kind of Q&A slash debate session. And so uh, VP Ops candidate, Evan Ray, you will have five minutes uh, starting from when you speak for your opening. Perfect. Um, so I'd first like to start by thanking the audience for tuning in. Um, Speaker Neoklaus and the Elections Committee for adopting this event and the election overall to an online format so smoothly and so quickly um, once we got that news. Um, so my name is Evan Ray and I'm running to be your next Engineering Society Vice President of Operations. Um, so I'm gonna start by introducing myself and then sort of go over my past and stock in um, so I'm currently a fourth year in engineering physics, um, and like many first year students, I really enjoyed orientation week, but didn't know how to get involved sort of beyond that. Um, I was worried about overexerting myself and being able to balance the load of an engineering curriculum along with extracurricular activities. Um, so as a result, the only thing I got involved in during first year, outside of intramurals and my frost group, 
um, was applying and becoming a frack. In hindsight, I missed the opportunity to start early and get involved with the engineering society and meet many more engineering students. However, I can't stress this enough, it's never too late to get involved. Um, I made it a personal goal to get more involved in EngTech because of this throughout my second, third, and fourth year here at Queens. Um, so this led me to holding multiple year exec positions, including webmaster, AMS representative, and now thank you rep. Um, while I was webmaster, I attended Engstock Council as a proxy on a number of occasions. Um, I was moved by the passion of my fellow students showed towards student advocacy, sort of which led me to running for a permanent role in Engstock Council as well as AMS Assembly um, the following year as the AMS rep. Um, later in second year, I also applied and became a member of senior water team that would have helped side 24 climb the poll if the pandemic had not interrupted orientation week 2020. Um, so this brings me to the present day where I work under the vice president of operations as the director of internal processes, which involves planning a trio of events, automating processes across NSOC and supervising NSOC spaces. Now I'm just going to give a short overview of my platform, which has four pillars. And those four pillars are one, pandemic recovery and a reopening plan to reopen spaces and operations as provincial guidelines allow. Two, improving initiatives aimed towards restoring engagement. Three, automating of business processes to improve overall efficiency across NSOC. And four, introduction of data analytics to allow for enhanced long-term strategic planning and capital planning through better informed decision-making for our services. I yield the rest of my time. Awesome. Thank you very much, candidate Ray. Um, with that, we'll get right into the question period. Uh, so a reminder, you'll have three minutes to respond to each question. And we'll start with this first one here. With COVID-19 causing frequent cancellations of in-person activities, how will you ensure a safe transition back to in-person activities at Queen's? Your time will start once you begin. You are currently muted. Okay, sorry. Um, sorry, could you repeat that one more time? Absolutely. With COVID-19 causing frequent cancellations of in-person activities, how will you ensure a safe transition back to in-person activities at Queen's? Okay, um, so I think sort of COVID-19 um, has been an ongoing problem and it's been super random at points where some weeks um, you'll be able to do things, you can go out, things are open, a couple of weeks later, things will be closed. Um, so I think the main thing there is constantly reevaluating sort of our plans and where things stand with the university of what we can do and what we can't do. Um, because I think the biggest thing there is that one week things might not be able to be open, a couple weeks later, they may be able to be open. So it's always staying on top of things so that when those circumstances change, um, we can be ahead of, ahead of time and get things open as soon as possible and not be behind. Um, so I think the base thing there is encouraging exec directors and service managers in the past couple of years um, meeting with, to meet with incoming directors um, and assist with the transition process so that when we go to be in person, we have all the knowledge that needs to be there um, and they learn, they've learned everything that needs to happen so that um, services can run in person. Um, I also think a big thing with transitioning back to in person with sort of a, a lack of knowledge and a knowledge gap being there is encouraging collaboration within the ED team. Um, I think making everyone comfortable um, with going to another director if they have any problems, someone that may have more knowledge um, from being in positions in past years or just not being an old, older student. Um, and I think the big thing there is also making myself approachable so anyone feels comfortable and welcome to approach me with any problems they're having be, being in the vice president of operations position um, and having a little more knowledge from working over the summer. Thank you very much. All right, um, we'll waste no time and we'll move to the next question, which is how will you create an environment for innovation and inclusivity with the executive team? Perfect. So I think within the executive, I think the main thing um, sort of when working as a team is clear communication. Um, e each of the three executives will be working on a, a wide range of uh, things within their own portfolios. And I think the big thing is um, having clear commu communication between the portfolios. You're all working on different things, but you need to work together on a lot of initiatives. Um, that being an example of accessibility initiatives as well as um, um, improving engagement initiatives. Um, I think the biggest thing there, like I said, is improving communication so that um, you're very clear on what you need done, how your workload is looking one week, how your workload's looking the next week, um, sort of in where you can help. Um, and I think that just all has to do with clear communication. Thank you very much. 
Next question. What are your plans to get more students involved in the engineering society? Perfect. So I think declining engagement is a major problem we faced since about March of 2020 when the pandemic hit. Um, I think that goes into my main pillar one of reopening. I think the biggest thing we can do to get people re-engaged is to have things open, to provide students those opportunities to engage with other students, meet students that they haven't had um, the opportunity to do online in the past two years. Um, so I think the main thing is reopening, but beyond reopening, I think um, the main requirement of people feeling so burnt out from, on, burnt out from online school um, is opening spaces, but additionally, you need to provide incentives to get people involved. Um, for example, if you're a SCI 21 or 22, you'll remember the main thing in our first and second years um, to get people involved was every club offered some sort of incentive, for example, free pizza to come to a meeting. That was the main thing to get people to come to places. That hasn't happened online, and so engagement has dropped. Um, I'm suggesting something along similar lines where you're providing incentives for people to come to something they may not usually go to, and they may feel kind of estranged to going to because they don't know anyone there. Um, an incentive similar to like that or running events, more events with like gift card prizes, for example, um, could be an example of how to improve engagement in small clubs like that. Thank you very much. Next question. Do you have any specific ideas for increasing the accessibility and popularity of student run tutoring and education services in the student community? Can you repeat that one more time? I certainly can. Do you have any specific ideas for increasing the accessibility and popularity of student-run tutoring and education services in the student community? Okay, so um, I think specific ideas. Um, so Angelinks being a student-run tutoring service um, is a little bit different because it's not under the services portfolio from the academics portfolio. However, I think um, an increased sort of teamwork between the director of services and the director of academics that do very similar things when running those services um, could definitely help improve um, those things. But for example, I think the most important thing for improving those is just the way they're marketed. Um, I think over the past two years as well through the pandemic, um, the quality of those services have, have declined slightly when going online. But that was also due to the fact of people feeling burnt out and not wanting to spend more time on a Zoom call. Um, I think to re-improve that is just to market them better to the students um, in exactly what they offer. Be, again, this goes back to clear communication. Be clear of exactly what they're getting um, from these tutoring services. Um, I think that's the most important thing when sort of advertising to the first year students or all the students. Thank you very much. So next question for you then. Talk about another actionable item from your campaign pillar and please describe it in detail. Okay, so for my first pillar of pandemic recovery and reopening, um, I think the most important actionable item is assisting with the transition of service managers and assistant managers. Um, so the incoming managers have all the knowledge required to run their services in person. Um, with the exception of science, science Quest, where I'd encourage the incoming managers um, and myself to reach out to the past managers from the past two or three years, um, because it hasn't had the opportunity to run in person like a lot of the services did first semester. Um, and so they can have a good idea of what in-person operations look like pre-pandemic. Um, I think this also involves a lot of work working alongside the AMS faculty, university, building administrators and the current ED team to see what was basically put in place this year to, to reopen events and how that's gonna change with the ever evolving COVID-19 situation. Um, as for pillar two of engagement, um, I mentioned sort of reopening is step one of improving engagement. Um, but I think restoring engagement is necessary to run the events and community initiatives, um, as well as maintaining the engineering spirit within the student body. We've seen that over the past two years, that with declining engagement, less people are motivated to get involved. Um, so I think improving engagement, like I said, by offering some way of incent some some way of an incentive, um, can definitely get people back involved. Um, as for pillar three, which is automation, um, this is sort of what I've been focused on this year is in my role as direct director of internal processes. Um, but I think the main problem that a lot of people have in the engineering society is the turnover rate and the transition problem, which means when people get hired in February, March, or April, they usually don't do a lot. They'll transition. A lot of that happens very poorly. Um, so they spend a lot of September and October when they start their role, learning how to do their role act properly. 
So that leaves two months to transition in, two months at the end, they transition out. So they have about four months to do meaningful, actionable changes within their roles. Um, so I think my main goal this year, my main goal next year, obviously with automation would be to automate the repetitive and time consuming tasks that allow for more time to be spent on actionable goals instead of your small weekly things that really shouldn't be taking up your time as a director or as a service head manager or an assistant manager. Um, and then pillar four for data analytics and long-term planning. Um, I think the main goal of this is to improve data available to incoming managers um, while they're creating their budgets. Um, it'd be useful to see um, sales and inventory data to help them with their strategic and capital planning. Um, hopefully I can achieve this through some projects collaborating with the SDEV team and sort of reworking what's underneath the director of internal processes to allow for sort of a project manager role between these groups and the SDEV team. Thank you very much. All right, um, another question for you. With no on-campus activities, what are your best ideas for uniting the student body? So in the case where we're fully online and we can't have um, activities in person, I think more focus needs to be put on what activities are in person um, I think the importance of certain activities need to be stressed in activities trying to keep the engineering spirit alive within the community and maintaining social interaction between students. Um, I think there are certain events that don't necessarily need to be run. Um, if they're run just for the sake of running and they have a couple of people show up, um, I've experienced that online with, a, with, for example, year execs running events that end up being quite pointless because no one shows up. I think more focus should be put into running larger scale events that people will actually come to um, that can um, actually provide some change, something meaningful for these students that provide them some social interaction that they will be missing from if they were in person, which I think is the biggest problem from the last two years is that a lot of students have missed out on the social interaction, the chance to make friendships of people that you wouldn't necessarily see in your classes every day. You just walk by them in the ILC. So without that, I think it's running events that, um, that allow for that to happen. Thank you very much. Um, it's the last question from my list in front of me there. So if there is anyone in the audience who wants to message me a question for candidate Ray, we should have time for a couple more. Um, but for now, service managers are essential to EngSoc operations. How will you ensure they have all the resources they need to succeed? So I sort of mentioned it before when I said, I think um, improving the transition process. Um, making sure that coming into the role, they know that their upper has provided them transition manual, their upper is there to help them. Um, they know that my upper and then I'll be there to help them with their role. Um, but I think the biggest thing, like I said, having the resources is having the knowledge. Um, and that comes from talking to people and discussing with people what's gone well, um, what's gone poorly in, in the past, and basically understanding what needs to be done to run their service in person or online. Um, so like I said, I think that just comes down to improving the transition process and assisting them with that as much as possible. Thank you very much. And um, here's one for you. So aside from the COVID-19 pandemic and challenges associated with that, what is another big challenge you see coming into this position and how do you hope to rectify it or tackle it? So I think the second biggest thing coming into this position um, as you'll see, I think of my four pillars, three are directly related to my portfolio. Student engagement is more of an NSOC wide problem. I think I put that as the second pillar because I think that's the next, the, the single biggest thing that um, we're gonna struggle with over the next year. Um, I think we have over the last two years, if we can't get back in person, it's going to suffer even more. And to the point where if we don't do anything about it, a lot of events will have to be canceled. A lot of things will go wrong with, things like design teams and clubs, because the last people to run them in person will have graduated by them. The knowledge will be gone. So I think in that case, it is, if we're online for another year, similar to what um, sort of the current exec and ED team we're working on is documenting as much as possible from what happened in in-person events so that when we get back to that, the knowledge is still there. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, another one for you. How would you hope that people reflect on your term as VP Ops at the end of the year? 
So unlike, I know a lot of people who run for these positions um, campaign on a lot of stuff and then end up with other problems that get in the way and they don't get a lot of those done. Um, I would hope that I could get, or at least get started. Um, I, I could make the changes to the automation portfolio that I've suggested, but I think the biggest thing is the data analytics. I think that sort of gets shoved at the end for a lot of vice president of operations. And by the end of their term, they're just burnt out. They don't have time to do it. They haven't done it over the summer. And I think the biggest thing with that is it's not a one-year project. It's a multi-year project. But the thing is getting it started and sort of laying out a roadmap for the next person of how it can be continued so that it actually will be continued, not starting it and leaving them with nothing. And then it just dies in a couple of years. Um, I think the biggest thing is just documenting those processes and change as well. I think we've seen that in the past where it's gone horribly wrong with things like Engstock Dash or even the Bank of Engstock, things that were created by students and then weren't documented well enough. And so a couple of years down the road, no one knows exactly how it works. So when things go wrong, there's no one here to fix it. Um, I think that's the biggest thing is just documenting things um, when we're trying to make improvements so that at the end of the year, these projects can be carried on because the turnover rate definitely hurts the position in the fact that long-term projects cannot be completed by the same people. Thank you very much. Um, and we'll go last question here for you. So who has been your largest inspiration within the society and how have you worked to create your own impact? So uh, my, the, the person that's been the largest inspiration within the society is, was my tech friend, Andrew Vassala. Um, throughout first year, um, I had a little bit, I had trouble adapting to, for, um, to first year. I didn't have many friends that came here from high school. I think three people from my high school came here. Um, I didn't know anyone. Um, so I think the biggest thing was the effort and sort of passion that he and all of my friends put into sort of study sessions, dodgeball sessions, or dodgeball intramurals, um, just anything and everything to help us get adapted to first year and feel comfortable and meet people. Um, I think I strive to do that. That's why I, that's the sole reason why I applied to become a FREC, I think is to pass that on um, to basically um, pass on the ability of helping people adapt to Queens Engineering. You're moving away. Most people are moving away from home for the first time ever. Um, I think just passing on that knowledge, um, I think is my, the sole reason I do a lot of these positions um, is to see the impact it can have. Thank you very much, candidate Ray. So that brings us to the end of the question period and into the closing period. So uh, you will have five minutes to close it out. Perfect. So my name is Evan Ray. I've been heavily involved in Engstock over the past three years. Um, the Engineering Society has provided me opportunities to grow and learn outside of the classroom. And that has been made my possible, that has been made possible by those who came before me and held these roles. Um, I want to continue that tradition of providing opportunities to as many students as possible to grow and improve personally and professionally. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I've completed three summer internships at the Bank of Montreal um, as a business analyst. Um, and that role, in addition to my experiences with Orientation Week, your exec and being a director, have all contributed to my unique set of skills that I think is a perfect fit for the Vice President of Operations. So for a recap of my platform, which has four pillars, those four pillars are pandemic recovery and reopening plan to reopen spaces and operations as provincial guidelines allow, which I think this will, <coughs> excuse me, this will mainly help um, improve students' mental health, academic success, and overall student engagement. I also want to improve initiatives aimed specifically towards improving engagement and restoring pre-pandemic levels of engagement. Um, pillar three is automation of business processes to improve overall efficiency across NSHOC. So whether that be in clubs, conferences, design teams, services, everything. And then finally, introduction of data analytics to allow for enhanced long-term strategic and capital planning through better informed decision-making. I think the main thing there is improving data available to incoming managers and assistant managers um, while they're creating their budgets. Um, so I wanna basically reignite that engineering spirit from past years within the ED team and the services, but also throughout the entire student body. Thank you and please vote for me and all the ideas that I have to bring to the table. Thank you very much, candidate Ray. All right, um, so that brings us to the end of the VP Ops part of the debate night. Um, and we will get into the VPSA part. So um, again, we have our one VPSA candidate, uh, Jane Cohen-Wallace. 
And whenever you're ready, Jane, we will do um, opening statements. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. And thank you so much for coming out tonight and taking this time from your schedule. And um, congratulations, Evan. That was awesome. <laughs> um, so I'm Jane Cohen Wallace, um, a second year engineering physics student, student. <laughs> uh, but it's actually my third year here at Queens. I started in the arts and science faculty with the intention of pursuing a major in physics or biology. I wasn't quite sure. Um, but after only two weeks, I knew that I wanted to transfer into engineering. I saw the passion and sense of community within the engineering faculty. And there was no doubt in my mind that it was where I wanted to be. This was in person. So it was full in-person engineering that I got to experience um, from an outsider's point of view. Um, so I chose to apply for first year instead of transferring into second year. So I would have the ability to fully immerse myself and start my degree alongside my peers. Um, now I was a little scared to go right into Envis, but that's okay. <laughs> We're there now. Um, ever since I was offered a spot in the class of Sci24, I have felt driven to ensure I make the most out of my time in this program. Last year, as a first year engineer, I was a first year project coordinator for the NSOC professional development team. I was also the first year rep for the Queen's engineering competition and a part of the gender and diversity in engineering mentorship program. These positions were my first introduction to the engineering society. And the first time I realized how much I enjoy working with these passionate groups of students. I then became a co-chair for the Queen's Engineering Competition and had the opportunity to hire and lead the executive team for the past year. And well, here I am now running for VPSA. Um, so now that you know a little bit more about me and how I got here, I would like to introduce my platform. It is based off of three pillars engagement, accessibility, and community. The first pillar, engagement, is aimed at increasing the participation of students in the society. Extracurricular activities such as design teams, clubs and conferences, year exec, and much more are all enriching opportunities that I believe are crucial for our development, both academically and personally. They give students a space where they can explore their passions surrounded by support. And increasing engagement in these programs and groups will benefit both the individual students as well as the faculty as a whole. My next pillar is accessibility. This is the part of the society where I see the most space for growth. An accessible engineering society is a place where everyone feels welcome and safe, where it is clear that there is no room for hate or discrimination. And pushing initiatives that will directly increase accessibility is something I plan on advocating strongly for if I am elected as VPSA. The last pillar of my platform is community. A strong support system is necessary for students to be successful in such a rigorous program. For Queens Engineering, this tight knit sense of community that has been fostered for decades provides the necessary support and inspiration for incoming students. But due to online schooling, as we've discussed, a disconnect has formed between upper years and first years. While some traditions should not be continued, those that benefit the society need to be emphasized. As VPSA, promoting the connection between years would be a focus in many of my respective portfolios. So um, that is my platform and what I would strive to achieve as VPSA. Because of my experience within the society, combined with my passion and drive to make an impact, I believe that I am an ideal candidate for this position. And I'm really excited to share tonight more about my vision for the VPSA's respective portfolios. Por portfolios. Um, thank you. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you very much, candidate Wallace. Um, with that, we will get right into the question period, um, starting with this question. So how would you handle conflicts when they arise in student teams? Uh, yeah. Okay, so as VPSA, 
you are a representative of the student body and you therefore you need to lead by example um so if there is a conflict in a team it will often be brought to the attention of the vpsa um from there the first thing i would do is address both parties separately to try to understand the root of where the problem stemmed from and how both parties um, can move forward to work cohesively as a team again. Um, and of course, it's really important to resolve the issue at the time, but it's also really key to figuring out why these issues are arising within the society and within groups, um, because that will help us prevent them from arising again. Uh, yeah, I yield my time. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to the next question then. What is one significant actionable item of your platform and how will it directly improve the lives of students? Okay, this is probably the biggest thing in my platform or one of the biggest things and it has to do with my second pillar accessibility. Um, at Queens, um, as stated on the website, um, a short term mental health model is provided to students. Um, unfortunately, for someone dealing with mental illness or someone who's recovering from sexual assault or acts of discrimination, a short term model is not enough. Um, students need the support for long term mental health assistance and it is the faculty that needs to be providing this. As far as I know, there are only two embedded counselors in the engineering faculty. Um, there's thousands of students. We're in a rigorous program and outside of just stresses from school, so many students struggle with mental illness and other things that I went over above. Um, so a big part um, that I would wanna change and that I really think would affect all the students is really advocating for a better mental health um, support system within the faculty. Um, and then one other thing that um, has recently come to my attention and I think would be a really big part of my work as VPSA um, is the anonymous reports. Um, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with um, NAM, non-academic misconduct. Um, if a student files a report against someone, let's say someone who has sexually assaulted them, the report is not accepted if it is anonymous and um, to be asking a student to put their name forward um, with this report, like in the wake of trauma is it's not okay. And we need to work to have a better system to accept these reports, even if they are anonymous. So that's another big thing I would want to focus on, really fine combing those policies. Um, I yield my time. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to the next question then. And that is, with no on-campus activities, what are your best ideas for uniting the student body? Okay, um, yeah, so this goes with my engagement pillar mainly. Um, so something that I thought would be really interesting is um, to have a way that students can anonymously um, just give their feedback. I feel like with online, there is not enough communication and cohesiveness between the students, the faculties, the disciplines, the years. There's just this huge disconnect. Um, we do surveys twice a semester for our profs, but there's no mass spread um, something saying we're here at all times and you can anonymously tell us how you're feeling about school, whether that be really getting the word out that people can email the VPSA or whether we set up an anonymous system. I think that could be really impactful for students to have a place where A, they can tell someone their thoughts, but B, have someone listening to them. And I think that fits perfectly into the VPSA portfolio. Um, and then another thing that 
I thought would be really cool. Um, I know there's like the Engeling tutor of the month, stuff like that. Um, really just expanding on that and spotlighting all these students who are working so hard for NSHOC, you know, putting in all these hours. I know for QEC, like we had a team of 20 students just working for nine months and there's very little recognition for that work that they don't have to be putting in, they're choosing to do this. So I think a kind of weekly like volunteer spotlight will increase engagement and also highlight the students who are working hard to keep the community together. Yeah, I yield my time. Thank you. Um, moving on to the next question then. What previous NSHOC initiatives pertaining to the VPSA portfolios would you like to continue? And what are new ones you would implement? Okay. Um, so the one that I want to continue, um, the engineering, um, the gender and engineering series, as well as the racism and engineering panel, the previous VPSA and president worked together to make this into a more conference style, all inclusive event. And I love that. I think it's really awesome. Um, the FIP, FIPCO, um, first year project coordinator, amazing way to get first years involved and let them see where they want to go in the society. Um, also two years ago, there was a gender and diversity and engineering mentorship program. It's gone now. I would love to bring that back. It was very valuable um, being in a group of students who are facing sim similar difficulties as you. Um, something I wanna change. Well, another thing that's being worked on and I wanna to continue to push is the gender neutral bathrooms in the ILC. Um, right now they are in Dupuis, but there's no signage, no students know that they exist. Um, and there is the funding and there is like the resources to have a gender neutral bathroom so that all students um, feel welcome in the ILC. Um, and then another thing that would be really awesome um, and I think really impactful for the students is having a representative in each discipline who advocates solely for the students um, who comes from a background with lots of experience with EDII, because often um, students in different disciplines from different backgrounds um, may not have um, someone to go to. And if they do approach a faculty member, that faculty member may not have the experience that they need. So just increasing these resources for students is really important. Yeah, I yield my time. Thank you very much. Moving on to the next question. How will you ensure clubs and teams are accessible and inclusive to all students? Okay, um, I've already touched on this um, quite a bit. Um, but I'll just go into some um, other like smaller things that I've been um, thinking about and that could add to the other main priorities. Um, not that these aren't priorities, they're all so important. There's just so many things that we can do. Um, so adaptive technology in the ILC for students with self-identified disabilities, because currently the only that's um, in Stauffer and uh, that would, it's, um, it's not very fair that like they would have to go to Stauffer. Having that in the ILC would be amazing. So they, can, they are part of the engineering community. Um, and looking at um, funds and stuff like that, you know, the bed fund is a great way. Um, and we could really like use that for adaptive technology. Um, the icons, like there's so many great resources already in place. I think really just working to make them benefit the students um, is, yeah, is really important. Um, I yield my time. Thank you very much. Um, so this is the last question from the list I have in front of me. And then again, if there are any audience questions, feel free to just um, direct message them to me. With that being said, uh, what is one major goal you will work to accomplish as VPSA?
Um, okay. <laughs> My main goal, um, I've already touched on it a lot, but my main goal is really um, working to improve the mental health services as well as um, the response to um, sexual assault and discrimination at Queens. I just don't think it's where it should be. And it cannot, uh, engineering cannot be accessible and welcoming to everyone if we are still facing these problems. Um, other than that, I think really what Evan touched on is so important, the transition between years, because we are in this position for a whole year, but realistically, we're not between the time that it takes to transition us and then the time we take to transition the next people. So really um, documenting um, what we're doing throughout the year so that we can have a solid background to give the next year. And so initiatives that we spend so much time on aren't just lost or brushed aside because they weren't quite finished up. Um, so yeah, those would be my main goals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so another question here then, how would you hope that people reflect on your term as VPSA at the end of the year? Um, at my time at Queens, I have encountered a few people who have completely changed the course of my degree. The first one was my Gail because I was in art sci and she, um, yeah, she was in, um, psychology, but she, um, was the one that supported me in switching to engineering and um, people I've worked under like Varnica, the um, director of PD if you, when I was a FIPCO, um, just all these people that had faith in me and that pushed me to apply for these positions that I never would have thought were possible of myself. Um, so at the end of the term, I hope that I can be that person to another student hopefully more than one student, but I think really just being a place where students can go to, where students can be heard and where students can really just be themselves is um, what I want to be as VPSA and what I would really strive for. Uh, thank you, I yield my time. Thank you very much. Um, another question here for you. <laughs> VPSA oversees a large number of students and student-run grassroots initiatives. How will you work to support the countless students working to make the society a better place? Yes, that is a great question. And um, so um, VPSA does have a lot of portfolios and within those portfolios, there's a lot of teams. Um, so I think first of all, hiring a really strong team of directors who reflect similar values and um, you have confidence will lead these teams, but then there also needs to be, you know, boots on the ground approach, um, not only attending meetings with um, my directors, but also with clubs and conferences, with design teams, um, letting them know that you're there. And um, so that would kind of be like what the approach I would take is just trying to talk to as many of them as possible. Um, and then experience wise, I think, I think this would be um, right up my alley because I'm very organized and um, for the Queens Engineering Competition, it was nothing close to the scope of VPSA, but I was managing four sub teams with directors and coordinators within that. So VPSA would just be an upscaled version of that. Um, yeah, I yield my time. Thank you very much. That brings us to the end uh, of the questions. And so, oh, I maybe spoke a little too soon. Give me a second. Ah, okay. One more question for you, actually. Um, as VPSA, you oversee a wide range of directors and interact with many students. It can be stressful at times. So, how will you take care of your own well being? <laughs> I feel like my mom sent in this question. <laughs> she always says that to me. Um, but 
I think I have learned that the hard way over the past year of really overloading myself. Um, first semester, I was co-chair for QEC and I was in eight courses, which was not a good decision. And by the end of the semester, I was very burned out. And um, when I first decided to apply for VPSA, I was, I was like, I'm going to finish my degree in four years still, like it's going to happen. And it took me realizing that it's not worth pushing myself to that level. I'm going to take an extra semester um, if I get the position. And I think just really taking a step back and um, setting boundaries when needed. Um, but yeah, just doing everything that you can, but like knowing when you have to stop and mental health is really important. So yeah, that's an awesome question. Okay, I yield my time. Uh, thank you very much, Kenneth Wallace. Uh, we'll now move into the closing period and I will have you close this book. You have five minutes. Okay. Um, uh, so thank you so much to everyone who came to listen tonight, um, especially to all the students, because this is an important step in advocating for the engineering society that you want to be a part of. Before I end tonight, I would like to briefly reiterate my platform and my three main pillars, engagement, accessibility, and community. A cohesive society requires students from all groups within the engineering faculty to be involved. Having voices from an increased percent of the student population will enrich the already existing groups and programs and allow for the creation of new ones. Focusing on increasing student engagement will result in a more united engineering society that benefits all its members. As well, embedding EDII into all portfolios under the VPSA is crucial to ensuring that students have access to the resources and support they need to succeed. Implementing specific initiatives to improve accessibility must happen to foster an environment that is accepting and safe for all students. Lastly, working to create a sense of community will allow all parts of the society and engineering faculty to come together and give rise to a strong support system. Striving to promote connections between years gives students the opportunity to find the place where they can succeed and allows the student body to progress as a cohesive community. As VPSA, I would act as a voice for the students. For students who are too busy with school, students who are too scared to speak out, or students who simply don't know how to ask for the support they need. Um, thank you so much for all coming out, and I hope that you choose to support me in this election. Okay. Awesome. Uh, so that brings us to the end of this debate night. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for coming and participating. I want to thank the candidates for giving um, such strong answers. And of course, I want to thank the elections team for helping this all run uh, very smoothly. Um, again, this does bring us to the end, but I would just like to remind everyone to make sure you go out and vote. Uh, voting will open February 1st. And of course, we do have another debate night tomorrow for the president candidate and the junior senator. So I really do hope to see you all there. Once again, thank you for continuing to get involved. Uh, please take care of yourself and uh, looking forward to hopefully seeing you at tomorrow night's debate night. Thank you.